And we are live. Thanks for joining us again in the Storycraft Cafe. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Uh, I am joined today by one of my absolute favorite authors and one of my favorite human beings, Dan Kinney, Daniel Kinney, Daniel Carson, however uh, however you find him, uh, you're going to love his work. I, I know I do. And and Dan's been a great friend for several years. And he, you know, when we started talking about doing this indie summer and really highlighting indie authors, indie publishers, you know, people that are just, you know, taking the entire business uh, kind of by the horns. I, I knew there was no better person to talk about this than, than Dan Kinney. And uh, so welcome. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you, Hank. It's great to be here and always chat with you. And I love what you do and you continue to do for the author community. So thank you. Well, thank you. That's a, I, that means a great deal. Uh, for for those of you who have not yet met Dan, um, Dan, did you begin your career with that um, with that memoir ish book? Um, I don't I don't know exactly what you call it, but it it kind of reads to me like a memoir. Yeah, so that was called Dad Genius, and it's it's sort of an odd sort of <laughs> memoir collection of Facebook posts and little short stories. Um, you know, my author career started in 2014 when I published uh, this middle grade novel called The Beef Jerky Gang. Uh, I followed that up with a chapter book series called The Math Inspectors. And then, you know, somewhere along there, I published uh, Dad Genius because okay. of in time, I was a stay-at-home dad, and I would post just things about what happened in our life. And there were several people who said, you know, Dan, I know you're doing kids' books, but the book I really want to read is the stuff <laughs> you keep posting on Facebook. So, uh, you know, I reached out to David Gatewood, my editor, and, and uh, I said, you know, I'm going to try to put together this thing. Um, and he's like, well, Dan, you know, you're not famous, so no one's going to read it. And I said, well, that's, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It's, Thanks for that encouragement, David. <laughs> that. Um, yeah, so, so that was a, a sort of a memoirish book that I, that I wrote. So, yeah. and I have it there just so that, you know, someday if I do become famous, uh, then I can push it on all the talk shows that I go on. So that's, I love it. that's what I love it. Well, you are um, the uh, the epitome, the the shining star, if you will, of what it means to be, as we here at Dabble like to say, um, a dinner table hero. Someone who who has a day job, who has a family, um, who has all of these life responsibilities, but you still have this dream that you're pursuing, and you still are getting um, you know satisfaction from telling your story, getting it out there, building this this business and this presence. And you know, David Gatewood, uh, you know, jokingly said that, you know, almost a decade ago, almost a decade. That's crazy when you when you think about it. Um, yeah. But your stories have have really permeated and and really um, it, with all of the things that you do now. Do you look back and think, wow, I I, I never thought that I would have the kind of reach that I'm having now. Yeah, so that's really good. And and actually, it's something I wanted to talk about today, uh, because sometimes I get caught up in the micro daily, weekly, monthly, even right. quarterly, uh, about like what I'm getting done, what I'm getting accomplished. And, and quite honestly, this past six months, uh, I have struggled to get things done and accomplished in the way that I had wanted. So I, I haven't felt so great, but there's some writer, I, I, man, I wish I knew his name, but somebody out there wrote a book called 4,000 Weeks, I believe. I've just okay. heard it referenced on some podcasts. And his point was, if you get out of looking at productivity from like a daily, weekly calendar sort of thing and look at this sort of eight year horizon, okay. um, things look quite a bit, more different. And it's interesting that it's eight years because I'm coming up on the eight year anniversary of publishing that first book. And if I look at that sort of thing, then I am like, oh, wow, you know, that's that's really great. It, it's it's really awesome that I've built up a library of kids books, of adult books. I've even, you know, told, uh, you know, have this memoir in which I tell a lot of family stories. And that's something I can really be proud of. Um, it, it's harder sometime on a daily, weekly basis to know what I'm getting done 
but over the long haul, I really am proud um, of what I've done and and am a little surprised at times um, to, to get the occasional message or email. I got a, a message one time from somebody who, you know, was going through chemo and she said, you know, I stumbled upon your Hope Walker series and it made me laugh and smile and it made it a little bit easier to get through. And I thought, oh my goodness, I, I never in a million years thought anything like that. So, I mean, that makes me very happy. Absolutely. Um, you you mentioned that uh, the the middle grade kid series that you began writing. Um, wh what was your motivation for writing those in the beginning? I, I know that you have eight kids and and so, you know, that's very much part of your daily life. But did it come out of wanting something that you could share with your kids? A hundred percent. So I was telling stories at night to my kids, which is not unusual at all. I mean, right. lots of parents, lots of dads do that. And there was a particular story that sort of just kept going. And one of my kids said, dad, you should make this into a book. And then the other kid said, no, dad, like for real, like a real book, you should really do this. And it kind of the way he said it, uh, he had so much conviction, you know, the kind of conviction that a child can have where he just thinks, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? Right. 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 He doesn't have all the, the different reasons of why that would be foolish or dumb. And uh, Sir Ken Robinson uh, has this beautiful TED talk in which he he says there's this child in this class and he's drawing a picture, or maybe she is, and the teacher comes up and says, you know, what's that a picture of? And the child says, oh, it's a picture of God. And the teacher says, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the kid says, well, they will in a minute. And uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I love that. And he talks about, you know, kids just have this ability to just go for it. Right. Or life has sort of beaten them down. Uh, yeah. and, and sort of taking the innocence away. And and so here I had this, this child who I think it was my son, Daniel. I think he was five at the time, just that perfect age. He's like, why wouldn't you, dad? Right. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks. And, and that's the reason I started trying to figure out how to write fiction and how to tell these stories. It was 100% for my kids so that they would have things to read uh, early on. Um, when I would make new books, I would specifically think, oh, you know, I know my kids, some of my kids like this book, but, but I, I want a, a book that these other kids might enjoy. So right. filling out that library initially was all about my kids. Well, and what's funny is, you know, if you are, um, you know, a conscious parent, a conscientious parent and, and you're, um, you're instilling in your kids, you know, you can do anything. You can achieve any goal that you set for. You have to be careful because they will turn that on you at some point. <laughs> They're like, well, dad, you said you could do anything. Go write the book. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think there was part of that in me. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was a stay at home dad, which is a, a great thing to do, but, but I don't know that I had ever imagined that I was going to be a sure. stay at home dad. That. And so uh, there was part of me that was, that was, uh, I'll just be honest, like thinking, oh man, I haven't, I haven't done quite what I thought I was going right. to do in this world. Uh, and there is this part of you that thinks, you know, you want to be able to show not just yourself, but your own kids that things are possible right? and, and you can go for things. And, uh, yeah. and that's certainly part of it. This is literally a conversation that I had with one of my daughters and her new husband uh, last night where we were just talking about how you have all of these, you know, plans now and 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're going to look back and see all of the things that happened that you never planned for, but you're grateful for them because you went in directions you never would have anticipated. And, you know, part of life's journey is just kind of hanging on for the ride. No, you're right. Hanging on for the ride. Like you, couldn't, <laughs> I, I mean, that is so well put. Um, and I loved reading growing up. We've talked about this before in the other yeah. podcast, uh, but I never thought I would grow up and write fiction stories. Uh, 
at some point in my life when I was in school, I thought maybe I'd write nonfiction. Yeah. But I never thought about writing fiction. Uh, so, so this certainly took me a direction I never anticipated. So eight years ago, you begin your writing journey, your publishing journey, and publishing. you you are writing for at that time primarily middle graders, um, um, adolescent readers. Shall we just kind of use that umbrella term because I know you've got a few different series aimed at different age groups. But an interesting thing that happens with that sort of writing and publishing is that you cannot market directly to your readers per se. You're, you're going through an intermediary, a parent, a teacher, a grandparent, something like that, who will then buy those books for the kids because you're, you're not communicating directly with the consumer. Now, as opposed to your Hope Walker series, which is a cozy mystery series, very much aimed for adult readers. And in the, I would imagine the mindset of connecting with your readers, getting feedback, getting sales um, has to be very different for those two things. How, you know, and, and eight years ago was really, you know, the, really riding the wave, the cusp of that indie revolution. Um, wh what were some of the challenges for marketing the kinds of books you were writing to an audience that you couldn't necessarily see? Yeah, so what I think is interesting is that not a ton has changed for middle grade authors in the last eight years, okay. meaning that I still think the dominant platform for getting books to kids is the traditional route via librarians, booksellers, okay. teachers, schools. I still think that's the dominant way to do it. Now, at the time, I was in a critique group and we were all trying to write middle grade uh, books and we were all trying to get agents. Uh, and at some point, I just stopped trying and I was like so many people at that time reading uh, J.A. Conrad's uh, Newbie's Guide to Publishing blog. And at some point I thought, you know what, let's just, let's just go for it. Let's Let's uh, let's publish this myself. And I personally really like the control of it. Um, but I, I figured out pretty quickly that if you want to make a ton of money writing middle grade, you still pretty much have to go through the traditional route. Right. Uh, it's not at all like indie publishing for adult genre fiction for the exact reason you said, that in adult genre fiction, you're communicating and dealing directly with a reader who reads a lot of books. Right. And, and that's just not who you're dealing with in the middle grade world. Uh, and so I still think to this day that if you want a chance of really, really making a good living writing middle grade books in particular, probably still the best approach is traditional. That being said, I know several middle grade indie novels who are making a full-time living. Yeah, I just don't know nearly as many as I know who write adult genre fiction. So, Well, um, having said that, uh, you have never slowed down in your writing and publishing to uh, to the middle grade audience. So what has been your motivation uh, to keep going, even though you know that other channels uh, are maybe more profitable for breaking in? What what keeps you what keeps you going and, and what keeps you penetrating the market? Yeah, so this is a conversation I've had with my wife several times, <laughs> and it revolves around what I think I'm good at in this world. And, and that starts with a conversation of all the things that I don't think I'm good at. And, and that's a lot. It's a really, really long list of things that I'm not good at. But then we I think get, most of us have those lopsided lists. <laughs> yeah. And then we get to the list of things that I'm really, really good at. And one of them is running full speed into other people. Uh, <laughs> So I played a lot of football, played in high school and college, and I'm, I'm like really good at that. Now, I'm not fast. 
you know, I don't have like twitchy muscles, but man, I'm like ridiculously good at running into people. But that doesn't <laughs> really do a lot for me in the real world. Yeah. The other thing I'm really good at is making stories. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think at some point you have to have a belief in what you're good at. And yeah. I really believe that I'm good at this. Uh, and so because I believe I'm good at this, I believe if I do good work consistently and hold on to my intellectual property long enough, not only will I build up something that I'm proud of, but I really believe at some point an opportunity will present itself, uh, an opportunity that will present itself for me to take advantage of. Uh, from a financial perspective, from a distribution perspective. And so I just have this deep internal belief uh, that if I do this long enough, well enough, and keep getting better, I think at some point it will pay off. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned Conrad's blog, and I remember during that time there were a number of people that were blogging and, and telling stories about how you know you could cash in on the on the Kindle Gold Rush. Uh, maybe they didn't say that per se, but, you know, there was talk in the community of, of that sort of stuff. Um, and we're not stretching. Yes. Yeah, much. With the Amanda Hawking and the John yes. Locke thing. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people came into indie publishing thinking they could write a really quick story, slap a cover on that they made in Microsoft Word, throw it up on KDP, make a fortune, get out and go do the next you know, thing that, that comes along. And there were some people that did that and they made a lot of money and they wound up being flashes in the pan. And, and then other people saw this as an opportunity to, um, to build a platform and to put stories out and to be consistent. And, and you're seeing people in, in 2022 that have built a, a, a large back catalog and are just working the system and, and having that attitude, like you said, that if I do enough work consistently at a consistent quality level, um, things are, are, are just bound to happen. They, you know, there, there comes a point where you tip the scale and it, and, you know, you just don't have any, any, it, it's going to happen, you know, regardless. Um, when, uh, when you start, when you start thinking back on, on the the previous eight years, were there times where you just thought, man, I, I'm doing all this work and it's, I'm not getting the return that I want. Like, like what, what keeps your spirits up and the motivation going during those times, you know, emotions ebb and flow and, yeah. you know, you, you know, it's easy to get weary and well-doing, you know, to, to borrow a biblical term and, yep. Uh, you know, what, what keeps you moving forward? Yeah. So um, again, I'll just, and again, so, so my wife's amazing. Like she's ridiculous. Yes, she she's amazing. She uh, not only the mother of eight kids, but I mean, she is as good at what she does. She's a nurse practitioner and she's as good at what she does as anybody is at, at what they do. I mean, yeah. I've ever met. I mean, she's really extraordinary. Uh, but she's also a realist and she's a pragmatist. And so she was the one who often would, and even to some extent still would be the one saying, gosh, you're doing, you're doing all of this stuff and it's just not uh, working. Uh, but, but I'll be honest, I, I get down about some things in my life, but, but yeah. I have, not, I have a real belief here. I just have always believed that at some point it would work. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this series of books called The Big Life of Remy Muldoon. Yeah. It's a series of four uh, books sort of written and illustrated in the style of the Wimpy Kid books. Now, I mean, they're not as good as the Wimpy Kid books. I'll, I'm not as good an artist as Jeff Kinney. Uh, they're, they're not as good, uh, but they were sort of my, my attempt at that. And, you know, those yeah. books themselves have over... 600 illustrations. Um, so I, sometimes I think about just to the amount of time it took just to do that series uh, with absolutely 
no expectation that there would be any financial return. And I think two things jump out. I love to create things. Uh, and number two, uh, I think my kids enjoyed them. And, and then number yeah. three, I just, again, I have this belief, you know, Neil Gaiman calls it putting bottles out into the world. Like, you know, you have these bottles, you put messages, you put them in the ocean. Yeah. And most of them don't come back to you. But then every once in a while, one finds the right person, or maybe it comes back to you. And, and I sort of think about that. You do enough good work. At some point, I just think something happens. So I personally have not been deterred by that. I get deterred by other things, but not by that. So Alice Snow in our uh, in our chat uh, says, "Do you have any uh, any ideas to get past writer's block?" And I, you know, with with the busy life that you lead and your schedule, um, maybe um, a, a qualifier for this is: Do you have time for writer's block? Do you, do you have do you have a production schedule that you're looking? you know, toward, and you know that you have a finite amount of time that you get to work on this. Um, like, how do you, how do you handle upcoming projects and, and keeping the train on the tracks? So I have a lot of thoughts on this and okay. I think the nuanced subject, uh, when I was part of that, uh, critique group, I was at the time, the only stay at home parent, all the other, uh, people in that group, were actively working and almost all of them at the time were teachers. Now okay. I am also a full-time teacher again, uh, but I remember at that time that I was able to get a lot more accomplished than them. Now, not because life as a stay at home parent is cushy and easy. Uh, mm -hmm. It just seemed like there was a rhythm of it that lent itself to creativity in a way that was a lot harder for the teachers in that critique group. Because what I saw from those teachers was they were in jobs that were intellectually and emotionally very draining. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very hard for them at the end of such a day uh, to be creative on a consistent level. Now, conversely, I would plan sort of my day with my kids so that it, it worked for me. So all morning I would be with children, I would be active, and I would be trying to get my two youngest children to the afternoon nap. And that whole time I was thinking about what I was going to be writing. And then the moment they went down for the, the nap, I had an hour and a half or so to write and the great thing is it was like I was outlining in my brain the whole time. And then I, I wasn't stuck because I knew what I was going to write. Right. The other advantage I had at that time was my older kids still were going to bed at a decent hour. And so I had that other block of time uh, late at night in which the house was quiet and I could be creative. Uh, so that actually, I thought, lent itself really well to being creative. Yeah. And then the other thing I had an advantage of is because I didn't have anything that sold real well, I didn't know what sold. And so I would just work on anything. Yeah. Uh, so as opposed to like writing the, the sixth book in a series, which can be really hard sometimes, I would just go from this to that to that. The combination of those things made it so that I didn't really have a lot of writer's block back then, and I would really not struggle at all with getting stuff done. Now, fast forward to today, I have a full-time teaching job. My kids are big. They fill up the whole house. They're <laughs> up all hours of the night. Uh, it is much, much harder for me to accomplish things than I used to. and. Yeah. Again, I, I saw Alice's question. I have really, really struggled over the last six months with things like focus and writer's block and, and all of those things. I have really, really been struggling. Now, I sometimes you encounter writers who talk about this and they'll say there's no such thing as writer's block and it just means your story is uninteresting and and okay, so th there may be some truth to some of what they say. 
Yeah. And there may be some truth to, hey, you just got to find a way to push through and do the words. I think that's too simplistic of an answer. Uh, yeah. I, I really do. Um, and I'm willing to, I, I can let you say something now, but, but I, again, I have lots more thoughts about this issue. Well, um, uh, if you want to, well, I was going to ask you, what is it, is it different for you with, you know, now going back to teaching, but I think, I think you also have to factor in what you said, your kids are bigger now mm -hmm. and there is, you know, it's, it's easy. And, and I say this, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm yep. qualify what I'm saying. It's easy to get two toddlers on a schedule. Um, sometimes yep. than it is to juggle the busy lives of preteens and teens. And you've got soccer practice over here and you've got football practice and you've got basketball games to go to and you've got dance lessons and, you know, and, and then, then the normal activity of, of family life and it, it can get yep. out of, out of hand and out of control really quick. And so what do you do to protect your creative time now? I'm still trying to find the right <laughs> approach. It, yeah. it used to be that what I would do is I would leave the house, you know, I would go places to write. And for a few years that worked. Um, yeah. And now I'm finding, and I don't know the reason, but I'm finding that's harder for me now. I'm still able to get out of the house. I'm just really struggling with uh, the ability to focus once I'm there. And so currently the best scenario for me is if I am in my house at a yeah. particular spot and it's quiet and nobody's there. And of course, that's almost an impossible situation for me uh, with my family in my home. Uh, so, uh, you know, like the last two days I woke up really early and I went to that spot and I was able to get a fair amount of writing done. Um, now typically I haven't been using that early morning time for writing because I've been, I've been using it as the time where I work out. Cause I learned if I didn't work out, then I wouldn't work out. Right. And so again, I'm, I'm really fighting to find that, that right balance where I can get everything important done that I need to get done. Uh, but one thing I would suggest to people is to have a little bit of grace with themselves. So yeah. uh, I will hear writers say stuff uh, like, you got to push through it. You just got to do the words. There's no such thing as writer's block. And I think sometimes that can be inspirational. I also think sometimes it can be unhelpful. And very uh, so, condescending sometimes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and, yeah. and I'll hear them say things like, and a lot of times these are some of the super producers who just produce voluminous amounts of work. And they'll say things like, well, anybody can do this. Uh, you know, you just got <laughs> you just got to stick to it, be disciplined and work harder. And again, I, there's an extent to which this is all true, but what if I were to, what if LeBron James came on this podcast and said, you know, Hank, anybody can do You just got to be willing. Okay. I don't know what happened. Yeah. You still, <laughs> you, you, you're, you're freezing there, Dan. Um, okay. How about now? Let's give it a second and let the, let the bits catch up. Yeah, I think you're good now. Okay. So somehow LeBron James knew we were talking about him. Right. And he <laughs> shut down the air. He's like, shut it down. <laughs> Thanks, King uh, James. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I mean, I think if he were to say that, most yeah. people would instantly say, no, 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 but LeBron, that's different. You're six, eight and a half. Right. You're, you're 260 pounds. You're solid muscle. I mean, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And here's what I think. I'm not so sure it isn't the same thing. I think in this American Protestant work ethic kind of culture, we always say, well, you you just, I mean, you're just not working hard enough. Yeah. But but isn't it possible that just like LeBron James has some innate talent, part of which might be his size and explosiveness, 
isn't it possible that there are some authors and writers out there who just have some innate capacity and talent for writing 10,000 words a day right. and releasing a book? Like, I don't know that it's just working harder. Yeah. Like, I think they have supreme talent. Yeah. And so when I hear those people say stuff like there's no such thing as writer's block and it only means your story is uninteresting, I'm not sure that's right. Well, like, I think mental health and all of these things are all real and they affect people in different ways. 100%. So if, if like you and I are not um, LeBron James level gifted, um, you know, that's where consistency comes in though, you know, it, it, and it, it may not be that I can do 10,000 words a day, but I could, I can show up at least every week and, and I can get some thoughts, uh, you know, in, in my, in my dabble, uh, you know, account that I'm, that I'm working in, um, on a piece of paper there, there, there is a, there, yes, we have to, we have to give ourselves grace 100%. Um, and you also need to be consistent and, and finding the balance between those two things is, is not easy, but you know, no, it's, it's, it's what we're, it's what we're tasked with. Yeah. So, yeah. so, he, so speaking of the consistency, what I've been thinking yeah. about lately is, is figuring out for each author sort of what's that, what's that minimum viable widget that you want to get out the door. Mm -hmm. And for me, the widget that I want to produce is the chapter. So that's how I think. Okay. That's the widget I want to create. Um, that's the hardest thing for me to do. If I get a chapter, that's a tremendous sense of accomplishment for me. And if I, I know if I get enough chapters that I can edit those into a book. Right. And if I have a book, I know I can market a book. Okay, so then the question becomes, how do I work backwards? Uh, how do I get my chapter? Okay, so to get my chapter, I have to write anywhere between 1,800 and 2,200 words. My chapters fall within that scope. Okay, so how do I write those words on a consistent basis when I often am struggling? And for me, it's some kind of writing sprint. And I think even if the writing sprints are unproductive and it's a slog, I think in five writing sprints, I can get a chapter. And each one of those writing sprints would be about 20 minutes. And so even on the worst day where the words are not flowing whatsoever and nothing feels smooth, if I force myself to do five 20-minute writing sprints with small breaks inside, I can get my chapter. And if I get enough chapters in the course of a year, I'm going to kill this thing we call it. Right. So. Right. Now we, we talk about the, the struggle of writing and publishing and how there are seasons in life where, where the words are just flowing and you're running to, to catch the story as it's going. Yep. And then there are other seasons in life where it's, it's a chore and it's a slog. Um, and, and you talked about being in, in both of those seasons yet, um, you have still published 10, um, cozy mysteries in the Hope Walker mystery series, which is a phenomenal series. If you, if you love these kinds of books, you're absolutely going to love, uh, Hope Walker and, and the, uh, the town of, of hopeless Idaho, uh, such a great, such a great setting. And the cast of characters is, is just great. Um, and with book 11 and a third season coming soon, uh, hopefully by this fall. Um, so you've not been slacking on the work. It may have been difficult for you, but your, your back catalog proves out, you know, that, that if you stick with it, you eventually get a bunch of books. Um, first off, um, you've, you have done all of this work in, in middle grade fiction and, what, what was the the transition to to make you want to start writing a series for adults um, and 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 why cozy mysteries? Um, I, I think you and I have talked before about you know wanting to write stories that entertained you, but you could still read to your kids. 
uh, and you know there there may be some some elevated humor, but it's nothing that that you would be uncomfortable with. So, um, you, why the transition? And what was it about this character that that made you say, you know what, I, I think I can branch off here and I can I can make a go of this as well. So even though I'm patient, um, so Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, internet, you know, Gary guy, v. business, Gary V, he talked yeah. about being, being patient and impatient at the same and, uh, and And so that's how I think of it. So although I'm patient with the catalog of kids' books that I'm building up, and I really believe at some point it's going to pay off, at the same time, time I thought, well, if there is an opportunity for me to write adult genre fiction, which I'm convinced is easier for me to market and will provide some nearer term cash flow, I would yeah. like to do that too. Uh, and so I looked around at what were the things that I might be able to write. Uh, and I looked at the things that I was reading and most of what I was reading at the time. And when I say the time, I would say five years ago uh, was um, thrillers. And so yeah. really the first thing I did was I wrote a thriller in J.A. Conrad's world. Uh, and it actually published it in his world. I, I don't even remember what it – was it actually called Kindle Worlds? Kindle Worlds, yeah. Yes. Where, where you – it was like uh, it was like sanctioned fan fiction, if you will. Yes, it was sanctioned fan fiction. I sent him the story. He had his wife read it. He's like, yep good enough. Let's publish it. So uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So that was the first thing I did. And it was, you know, it was in his world. It was in his Jack Daniels world. And uh, it was, you know, a serial killer thriller kind of a book. And, and I liked it, but then I thought to myself, can I write about serial killers the rest of my life? <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Even though I, I like reading some of that stuff, I thought yeah. I, I can't do this. So living as, in that darkness is, is a different thing, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And I'm really intrigued by crime and I like murder, but I didn't want to get too dark. And so for me personally, the world of cozy mysteries made more sense. I, I found that, you know, uh, as my kids were getting older, they liked shows like Psych and monk, yeah. uh, which really, if you had to define them are really cozy mysteries, right. uh, there's a murder, there's a whodunit, but there's a, a lovable cast of characters. There's a unique location. And I thought to myself, you know, that's the kind of thing I want to do. And then when I came up for the story about hope, uh, uh, first of all, Idaho, that's where my wife and I honeymooned. And we always look back to that trip with such great um, uh, you know, fondness. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll place the town from our trip. Uh, but then at the same time, I wanted, um, you know, I wanted somebody who had left home and who had a lot of brokenness. And so that when she came back home, she really had a lot to deal with. Yeah. And I didn't want her perfect. I wanted her like some of my readers get frustrated uh, because of her awkwardness and they'll say, oh, my gosh, there's no way a good looking woman would have gone this long without a date. And I disagree. I, I mean, I know people like this. Uh, yeah. I know people who've been really scarred by life and it's it's really affected them in a way that's quite frustrating to other people. Uh, and so that's the character I wanted to write about. Nice. Um, what sort of, you know, you, you talked about not really um, knowing the market or uh, a lot of the, the market factors with, with middle grade and you just wrote what you wanted to write, knowing that if you built that catalog, it would eventually catch up to you. Um, I feel like, and uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, that you did a little more um, market research before Hope Walker took off um, this time. You're, you're very much more intentional 
um, like you, you are laser focused on a particular thing. Um, when, when you started identifying, like, these are the kinds of stories that, that not only could I tell, but I would enjoy telling. And I could, I could spend a lot of time with this cast of characters and here, um, what did you do to start preparing yourself, uh, to write? And, and this touches a little bit on the, the right to market conversation, you know, and understanding, you know, not necessarily that you are writing by checking check boxes um but you're you're understanding your audience so that you know that the work you're going to do um has the most bang for your buck if you will yes so as i was thinking about what can i write for a really long time within the cozy mystery world uh i was seeing uh, so so this is what i came up with i enjoyed hallmark mysteries but there was something about them that was missing for me. Yeah. Um, at the same time, when I was doing this, my favorite show to watch was Longmire. And we've talked about Longmire oh, yeah. before. And so in my mind, I was thinking, gosh, I kind of want something like a Hallmark mystery, but also something more, a little more like Longmire. Is there something yeah. that hits that sweet spot? Okay, so then I started surveying the cozy mystery uh, market. And, you know, I, I very quickly came across Jonna DeLeon's Misfortune series. And although I think she says it's not really a cozy mystery exactly, um, I think that was, that was my whole point. I yeah. came across her book and I thought, okay, now this is different. This just isn't your traditional, traditional isn't the word. This isn't the same as some of the cozy mysteries I'm reading. Uh, right. It's not quite as cute. And I don't mean that condescendingly. Um, I just mean it was different. It had an edge to it. Uh, it. It fit within sort of this cozy mystery world, but it was different. And to me, it hit that sweet spot that I wanted. The, the between a Hallmark mystery and a Longmire right. episode. I thought she achieved that well. So for me, it became, okay, how can I write kind of like her? And it seemed, although she might disagree with me, uh, because I, I don't know how she came up with the series originally, it seemed like she was writing sort of like Janet Ivanovich. Although to be clear, yeah. Jana is in my opinion, way better uh, because she's like a real mystery writer. She's like legit. Um, but I, I felt like she was doing for Cozy's something tangential to what the Stephanie Plum series was. And then, she, you know, she was knocking it out of the park with Misfortune. So I said to myself, okay, for somebody who gets done with the Misfortune series, how can I write something that they would enjoy. And so it became very simple. How can I learn from what she does, but put my own spin on it so that when somebody gets done reading her book, she looks at my cover and she says, oh, I think I might enjoy this. And then and they read my book and they say, you know, it's it's not quite like Jana, but it's pretty good. And, and that was my whole goal. So um, you seem to be very intentional in your publishing you've set up um so that uh every five books are a different season and we we talked about this a couple of years ago where you were thinking you know these would actually make great tv shows and if i if i package them in a way that seems to translate that way and and people are accustomed to binge watching netflix and and getting a season and then waiting a year and getting another season you know it, People are, are already accustomed to that. Do you plan out a season before or are you, uh, you know, we normally ask, you know, do you plan how much planning goes into a book? But but you're thinking seasons. Is there a, a season arc uh, like like how how much are you thinking about this concept of seasons and how they work together? Yes. Yeah, so when I planned out this series from the beginning, I knew it would be in five book seasons. And so I planned out the entire series arc 
uh, in general. And I okay. already knew from the beginning what the, the basic arc of each of the first three seasons would be. And then I said, I, I created an arc for a potential fourth or fifth season, depending on whether or not the books were well received. But from the beginning, I knew that the first three seasons uh, were a story that I wanted to tell. And I was just going to tell it regardless of the reception. Yeah. Um, and so I thought about those things very intentionally from the beginning. And so when I you know, start on season three here, uh, I, I think of a season with the same sort of beats that I might think of a particular novel. And I know there's certain beats I have to hit in this season to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Gotcha. So um, at the heart of every cozy mystery, we, we've got a sometimes quirky, um, a lot of times female sleuth, um, young-ish, you know, possibly early 30s or so. Um, but at the heart of those is a mystery at each one. There's, there's going to be a dead body or there's going to be a high store, you know, something. And then, you know, our intrepid sleuth has to, you know, unravel the case. Um, how do you, how do you think about what mysteries are going to, you know, you've got the, the kind of big meta arc, uh, that you've got over the entire series and the, the smaller meta arcs for each season and then specific arcs for each book. Um, how do you come up with the the mysteries that you're going to incorporate into these stories with each one? Yeah, so I'll say from the outset that those readers, uh, those writers who write a lot of cozy mysteries and who publish on a monthly or even bi-monthly, oh, yeah. uh, this is the part of it that astonishes me. Um, I really, I, like I, I, I get at some level how they're just super fast at writing. What I don't, I can't comprehend is how they come up with so many mysteries. That's yeah. really, really, I think, I think it's a superpower and I think it's these, amazing. These are the same kind of people that can do a Rubik's cube with one hand. It's amazing. I, I just yeah. think it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's astonishing. So what I think about, I think in terms of uh, the first thing I do when I'm trying to come up, with a new mystery is I first look at my list of, I, I have a list of motives okay. and I have a list of uh, types, ways to murder people. Um, and one day I had my list of like ways to murder people and I was leaning back in my chair and I was like deep in thought. And I was thinking about it super like just clinically yeah. And I and I I kind of felt my my seven and eight year old son off to my left, and I say, "Boys, come here, help me with something." They're like, "What do you need help with?" I said, "I need a new way to murder somebody." And my wife was sort of, she's like, "Dan, no, we're not, <laughs> we're not doing that." And I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking of like, "Man, I need another way to murder." And I was like, "Yeah, that's that may not be the best." thing to talk it. about with my seven and eight year old, but I start there. So I've got a uh, look at what are the past ways that I've used to murder people. Yeah. And then what are motives that I've used? And I, and sometimes I want to intentionally make the next mystery I work on very different. And sometimes I intentionally want to make it really similar just to mess with people, yeah. uh, just to make it seem sort of random, right? Um, and so I start there. And then once I start there, I think of, okay, uh, the, 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 the book is, uh, so this, this 12th book is going to be a hopeless celebration and it's going to be 4th of July themed, right? And then I just start thinking, okay, so who's my, who's my victim? And then I take a big piece of paper and I write the victim's name in the middle and I circle it. And then I'm like, okay, who are my suspects? And I write four or five names around. And, and then I just start playing with alibis and motives and 
ways of murder. I figure like everybody <laughs> has to have like a good motive. You know, I mean, everybody in that suspect li list should have a, a really good motive. Um, but th that's how I start. So your, your wife, Teresa is a nurse practitioner, as you said earlier, do you, do you ever bounce ideas off her? Like, like, you know, if I did this to this person, would, would this have this desired outcome? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's a great question. I called her the other day, uh, cause I was deep in thought and I asked her specifically that kind of a question. I say, Hey, real quick, if, <laughs> if somebody injected this into them, what would, she's like, what? I was like, just don't think about it too much. <laughs> just, just go with it. <laughs> just go with it. Right. So yeah, I do. That's, that's funny. Um, one thing, um, you know, if you've, if you've watched indie publishing for very long, you know that the marketing and, and we talked a little bit about this with, you know, how you market, to middle grade readers, but with this series, you can market directly to readers and you've gotten a lot of great feedback. I mean, your first book, um, a hopeless murder has thousands of reviews on Amazon and you've reached a ton of readers and, um, you know, you have a lot of people that are following along with this series. Um, but marketing is a, is a moving target. Uh, and you really have to stay on top of, you know, what, what's working this month that wasn't working, last month and one thing that i've noticed and i think we're both in a in a facebook group the the 20 books uh group and there's a lot of talk um recently about um audiobooks on youtube and you recently started posting your audio versions of the hope walker mystery series on youtube for free full versions and um w which i think is phenomenal that's that that has to be a great way to get new readers into your series. Um, talk a little bit about just what the, what, what your thought process was from there and, and what you hope um, that, that this does for your publishing. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought this up. I, I think this is a really interesting uh, area. Okay. So I may be totally wrong on this, but maybe help me out with some of the numbers. Okay. Kindle, Kindle Unlimited right now. What is the monthly Kindle Unlimited price? Uh, is it is it ten, is it ten bucks or so? Um, ten or eleven, something like that. Something yeah. So, like so that. let's I'll, say I'll it's, just it's, do a quick Google while you're talking. Yeah, and then at the same time, what's the Audible monthly price? Fourteen to sixteen dollars, somewhere in there. Okay. I think it's and, like sixteen and some change when, when it's okay, all said so and done. And along with that, you get one credit a month. Is that yes, how it works? One credit a month. Yes. And access to some okay, so special this is deals occasionally, but yeah, one credit. Occasionally. Okay. So, yeah. so this is really interesting to me. Kindle Unlimited, you know, your reader a month for Kindle Unlimited. Your favorite thing to do is read. For 10 yep. bucks a month, they can read unlimited amounts practically. I mean, yeah. it's it's technically like 20 borrows, isn't it? Something like that. Well, I think it's it, is it 10 rate? at a time. Um, but I've never bumped up against any limits other than yeah, uh, you know, it, it'll say you've already got 10. Which one of these do you want to return? You know, but but for but I've, all never, of I've never had it tell me you've borrowed too many this month. Right. So for all intents and purposes, for most people who are voracious, re there's a little messing with their feed. Are we there again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for we're, most, we're, we're yeah. Good. So first LeBron, and that was Jeff Bezos. He's like, shut it down. I'm tired of these people talking <laughs> about. So Kindle Unlimited, 10 bucks a month, you can pretty much yeah. read an unlimited amount of stuff. Yeah. Basically. Okay. But the same is not true with Audible, okay? Right. If you're a voracious Audible listener, you pay your thing. You can't listen to an unlimited amount. You got to spend more money. Okay, so right. from, from the, the KU reader's perspective, it's Kindle Unlimited is a great deal. But from yeah. the, the voracious listener's perspective, Audible is not necessarily a great deal yet. 
Right. Okay. So, so why is that? Is it because the amount of money it costs to store audio is so significant? Is that why? I don't know. But here's what I know. There are a lot of authors who are making a full-time living because of Kindle Unlimited. Okay. Yes. Who, who yeah. never would have ever made a full-time living being a writer but this business model works for the reader and it works for the author. Yes. I do not think that such same situation exists yet in the audio world. Right. In the audio world, you have a really pretty expensive subscription service for listeners, for, for you know, listeners, and it's really not paying authors that much yet. Now, if you're a yeah. big time author who's got huge ebook sales, yeah, you're making a lot on audio, but you understand it's not the same situation as it is with KU. Well, it's one of these economies of scale where if you if you scale up to a certain point, yes, you make a killing. Um, if you're an an average mid lister, um, eh, you know, maybe not so much. But it, yeah, at a point it does. But for most people, they're not making a killing on audio. Okay. So here's my point. I think mid list authors are still looking and, and, and I think listeners are still looking for the right business model. Yeah. And so I think we got to keep experimenting with things. Um, I think some people wonder if Spotify will eventually be the answer. Uh, but until now you think around and you say, okay, so who out there has mastered audio and has mastered getting it to listeners and has found a way to monetize it? It's YouTube. Yeah. And so I think it's very worthwhile uh, running an experiment to see if this works. You know, you, you yeah. throw the audiobooks, not like I'm making a ton of money on audiobooks on the other vendors, anyways. So I, I have very little to lose. Uh, the great thing is I own all of my own rights so I can do with them whatever I want. So to me, it makes total sense. Put them on YouTube. See if I can find listeners and uh, eventually maybe I can monetize the channel and actually do quite a bit better. Uh, but I think we just have to keep searching for the right business model because we haven't found it yet. Well, and you have to wonder, like I have no inside insight uh, to KDP or, or the you know, how this came to be, but you have to wonder that when Kindle first marketed, uh, when, when Amazon first marketed the Kindle, that there had been other e-readers out there and they had done, um, moderately well for yep. a niche audience. Um, but it was not until they developed KDP, which then allowed people to publish stories that could then be delivered to their Kindle. That's when everything changed. And, I don't think that they had the foresight to to realize what today's KDP market would be back then. Maybe they did, but I, I think it was a lot of experimentation and a lot of end users that then said, okay, with this tool, I can do this. And and maybe the people that developed the tool, you know, had no way of foreseeing that. But I think you're absolutely right. Experimenting with tools that are out there. And coming up with unexpected results, that, that's kind of the indie spirit. Totally. And, you know, I started publishing in 2014, so I just barely missed that initial wave. Right. Amanda Hawking, John Locke, Hugh Howie, J.K., J. Conrath, Barry Eisler, that initial sort of wave. I missed right. that. Um, so I, I saw these really smart, aggressive indie authors and, and, you know, it was almost like, oh, I know who they are. And if they're experimenting with putting audio on YouTube, I'm not going right. to miss this wave because these are some of the smartest, brightest, hardest working, most successful uh, authors in our space. And they know, I mean, I'm willing to, to bet that they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Did I see an announcement um, a week or so ago that there's a new series that that you're spinning up soon? Something about a 
Yeah. So, I mean, soon is not the right word. Uh, <laughs> again, my my creative brain writes checks that uh, the reality <laughs> who I am cannot cash. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the great thing is I've got plenty of ideas. Uh, yeah. So, if I ever figure out how to be consistently productive and and carve enough space in my day, uh, I'm going to be just fine. Uh, Cause I don't want for ideas. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's several spinoff ideas I've got, uh, at some point I'm going to launch the hope and Katie mysteries, uh, which will take hope and her best friend, Katie, who most readers really, really enjoy that relationship. Yeah. And I'm going to put them in their own series in which it'll usually start in hopeless. And then for some reason they'll find themselves traveling to some place uh, where some murder happens. And I just thought it'd be a ton of fun to do. Uh, so that's one of the the series. I had hoped to already have published the Baking School Mysteries by now. It just hasn't happened. Uh, I'm hopeful that sometime in the next six week, months, the first book in that series will release. And then the one I, I just put up recently, it's called the Thomas and Edison Mysteries. And uh, it'll be my attempt to sort of answer what Janet Ivanovich does in her books, which trend to be slightly more thrillerish um, yeah. than than maybe cozy mysterish. Uh, again, I think she occupies a really unique space, so I think that's hard to say. But I wanted to write something that's that's really really similar to what she does. And so the Thomas and Edison mysteries will be my attempt to do that, but I'm not there yet. So that'll be a while. <laughs> well, Dan, um, keep doing what you're doing. We love w what you put out and uh, you're an inspiration to a lot of people. You know, your, uh, your self-deprecating humor um, goes a long way because we can look at your back catalog and see that, that that you're not slouching even if the uh if the work is hard sometimes um tell everybody where they can find you is is your amazon page your amazon pages uh the best place to catch up with you yeah so if you go to amazon you can look at daniel kenny that's k-e-n-n-e-y uh and you can find the 35 plus children's books that i've written uh, and then if you go to Amazon and go to Daniel Carson, that's C-A-R-S-O-N, you can find my Hope Walker Mysteries. I have websites, but they're, I mean, author Daniel Carson, author Daniel Kenny, but my brother told me that I never like put the metadata in right uh, when I set them up because details details right so i think it's hard to find those websites unless you like it's literally like a 1997 website where you have to spell it perfectly in order to find it uh so amazon's probably the best way to find me well we'll send everyone to to see you if you are looking for middle grade books for those uh those readers in your life or if if you want to follow along with a fun uh adult series with the hope walker series jump in today you won't be disappointed dan and you, if you want something free go to youtube go to Absolutely. dan carson books and you can listen to the first three books in the hope walker mysteries for free that's free audio so you know i decided today i would call that fraudio so you can get <laughs> so you can get your fraudio books at youtube the Daniel Carson books. He's got dad jokes too. Um, thanks, Dan. Thank you, Hank. <laughs> <laughs>